In this video, I want to cover a topic that I touched on a little bit earlier in another one of my videos. And, and we're going to be sending or attaching several links into this video. Three or four of them are to Midland for Midland Valves and then one is for Rego. Um, what I'm going to be addressing here is specifically two of the Midland Valves. As I mentioned earlier in another video, as I'm sure some of you have probably already figured out, the FRA is on a kick. They're seriously looking after and investigating rail car valves. In particular, the liquid and vapor, the two inch valves, making sure that the hand wheels are not too tight and that the plugs are not chewed up, rounded off, or that they leak. And so one of the ways, one of the things I got, um, I got from my FRA inspector, he added a couple little things to highlight on one of these uh, printouts that I've got is about how tight to you tighten down a hand wheel for a Midland valve in particular. Before I get into the Midlands, I want to touch a little bit on Rego. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've I really cannot remember the last time I had a Rego rail car valve have a broken hand wheel, have a hand wheel that would back off by itself, that leaked really bad, that failed to seat properly. Now part of that is because there are far more Midlands on the cars that I deal with than there are Regos, but nonetheless, there probably has been one or two, I just don't remember, but because there are so few. In my opinion, my personal experience is that Rigos are the superior valve. And every car that I have some issue with when it's related to the valves, consequently, are 99% all Midland. There's another company out, uh, ACF, they have a proprietary car service valve. They occasionally give you trouble. They're old valves and you may not run across them, but they're about the other one percent of cars I have trouble with and so if you go look at the Rego uh, follow that Rego link it'll give you um, Rego's line of rail car valves it doesn't have as good a printout or a good a diagram as some of the Midlands that you you'll find if you'll open up those links but it's really good it's really nice to see what's out there and it's very important, and I think, it, it's helped me a lot to look at all that I can of all these diagrams to see how things go together, how things work, and the better you understand how things work, the better we can be at troubleshooting problems as they come along, because inevitably, they come along. And also, the FRA has, like I said, has been really investigating their goal is to visit every hazmat facility every hazmat rail car facility out there in the u.s so if they haven't come to you yet you're on their radar and their plan is to come out there and one of the things they're running into matter of fact i got a little um i don't know how well you can see any of this one of the things that FRA is running into is right up here in this top part is people are customizing tools. I sure have been motivated to do the same thing because sometimes you cannot easily open these Midland valves. And once again, it is exclusively Midland valves when it comes to being tightened down too much, being unable to easily open them. I've had it so bad it's taken two of us on one hand wheel to get it. And I've been tempted to make my own tool. Well, the FRA is finding out that a lot of guys are making their own tools to not only open and close the hand wheels on these two inch Midland valves, and it's predominantly the 720 and the 721 valve, but they're also finding guys are custom making tools to open up the needle valves. It says right on there, I mean, it's plain as day that these things are to be hand tight and some of the newer ones are to be finger tight only. Well, all it takes is one or two guys to crank it down really hard with a wrench 
and then you distort the Teflon soft seed inside there and then now you've just made it to where everybody else has to tighten it down more than normal and so that's what also one of the things the FRA is investigating and they have on their radar so like I said there's a picture I, I hope you can see somebody, somebody's customized a small little wrench and then down in here they're also finding out that a lot of guys are not treating their tools with a great deal of respect. They're not treating their tools as if they owned them and they're finding that a lot of the stingers, stubs, whatever you want to call them, whatever attachments you've got, they're finding damaged acme threads and they're finding damaged pipe threads. And their hypothesis is that it's just generally a result of poor housekeeping. And then something in relation to that is over here they're finding out that they're running into a lot of damaged distorted threads on the pipe nipples that they thread into the valve and again their hypothesis is is that guys are not being properly trained on how to lubricate those threads well we use oil that's how we get around it we use oil and some guys a lot of guys um I've even seen a, a training video somebody put out that you just thread them in. Bare threads. Thread them in because it is a temporary fitting. It's, it's designed to last long enough to do the job. And so they just thread them in. And they just expect that you know, they're going to have to replace those pipe nipples two, three, four times a year. Well, if you don't use oil, you can, some guys, I've seen guys use anti-seize and anti-seize is good problem with anti-seize is it can be very expensive not to mention very messy same thing applies to pipe dope you can use pipe dope it'll work it's also very messy so there are some negative consequences to using either one of them and you can always go back to the good old faithful teflon tape although personal experience is you know, I can prove that Teflon tape has the most negative consequences associated with it simply because it'll tear, it'll shred, it'll shard, it'll just leave strips that get into everything. So, one thing to consider if you haven't added it already into your SOPs, make sure to highlight, uh, highlight the simple fact that everything is to be, when it comes to valves, no no extra tools to be used you know make sure you put that in the sops however however you want to phrase it whether it's just everything's done by hand or or however and that how do you seal your threads are you using anything or using something and then also put something in there in your sops about your housekeeping so those are just some of the things the FRA is finding and the FRA is targeting on. And if they do come across your place and they do find that you're using tools, they're going to ask you to stop using them because they recognize the problem and they don't want us to continue using tools to mask the problem. They're going to want us to shop it. Their basic attitude is, is they don't care why it came to us if it came to us we have they want the last person to have that car to be the responsible person to go and if you have to use a tool to make it shut to where it can be shipped they want that thing sent to a shop so now getting into these printouts i printed them out here just so i could show you um first one here's a needle valve uh, this publication, this last revision was 4 of 04, and this appears to be the newest one that I could find. And it covers the, this style, which is a really common. You'll see that one a lot. And then on page 2, you'll see an older one. I've seen it mostly on much older cars, and it's right there. And what they want to draw attention to is second page under operations steps one two and three 
And it's where they want to say, just be careful about this valve. Don't abuse this valve. It's designed to only be opened up enough to do the job. They're saying here about three full turns. They're also warning about the fact that there is a roll pin inside this packing that is used as a stop. And if somebody really aggressively opens that thing up, you can shear it off. And if somebody rebuilds it and forgets to put in the roll pin, you can open that valve stem and pull it completely out. And they also emphasize in here again, hand tight, no tools, hand tight only. And it is frustrating for something as small as a sample line valve, a quarter inch pipe plug, something like that, that just will not stop leaking. And I get it. I've had to shop several cars over that too. But that's what they're wanting us to pay attention to. And so that's why I'm also adding this video so you can have the links and you, you can readily find it and uh, read it for yourself. Second one is for the actual 720-721 car valves. Uh, this one was, its last revision was in June of 2018, so this appears to be the newest one as well. This is a, essentially it's a rebuild manual on the components in here, and it's a very good diagram. It'll help give you a good idea and a good understanding of how, this, how these valves are built and how they operate. And then there's a few things to be highlighted in here. Um, page 11. First one to be drawn up. Page 11. Section 3.1.1. says, bear in mind the middle and angle valve will seal completely with much less torque than a metal to metal seated valve. It should close with the same approximate torquing as with a faucet on a wash basin. They go in here a little bit later and they talk about uh, applying a torque value of 20 to 30 foot pounds of torque to close a valve. It's just I'm going to address it a little bit here a little bit, but let's just don't get hung up on, on the word torque value. You know, don't, just don't, torque is a when it comes to pipe fittings, torque is a misnomer. It is a false flag. It puts our attention on something that is not as... It, we use torque to tighten, of course. Torque is force, you know, it's force applied. But that's not what we're looking at. That's not what we're focusing on. We're, our focus is threat engagement. And so now they've got that. And then go to page... I think it's... Page 15, and you can look in there, and you can see how that disc, there is a, um, I think they call it a gasket retainer, but it's a seat disc. And then you'll get a good idea of how it's connected to the valve stem, and then you go to page 17. And they have a picture there of the valve stem. Um, Rigo, Marshall, Midland, they all follow the same basic uh, design. And the best way I have to visualize it is essentially that valve disc, a retainer disc, whatever it is that anybody wants to call it. It's essentially a socket and then the um, stem is essentially a ball on the other end as to and then they have their own proprietary way of how they connect that seat disc with the valve stem the whole idea is that that seat disc can spin independently it can move it's not directly physically hard attached to that valve stem which was some of the older valves you go back far enough like when i started in the industry that was, that was a pretty common thing and you'd run into a problem that as you would draw that down and then you got the actual machine hard seat in the bottom of the valve and then you tighten it down with the hand wheel and that disc would turn with the hand wheel you would essentially be mashing and twisting it 
in there and then it would over time cause that to deform cause that to leak to where you had to do more and more and more and more force to even get it to seat every time you did it and then also it was also not very forgiving when it came to foreign material coming in between those two well, people have been switching over and they begin switching over to a more resilient uh, soft seat material something that's a little bit more forgiving but when they came up with that essentially it's a um, ball and socket that gets in there so that when your seat disc goes down it may or may not spin a little bit with the valve stem as it's threaded down but it's going to sit and it's going to seat pretty flat pretty evenly initially and then as you tighten down the hand wheel you are driving force straight down in the center of that seating disc and it's far more uniform it doesn't sit there and turn and if there is a little bit of forward material the idea is that you will kind of compress around it and get a good seal and then when you go to open it up you open up that hand wheel it'll just lift straight up it won't sit there and turn you know that eighth of a turn a third of a turn or half a turn whatever it was that it would turn until the valve you know because if you look at a valve stand they're usually pretty aggressive thread so they're designed to uh, move rather quickly it, it won't it won't do that and one thing about a midland i notice it far more than i do a rego is that when you open up your car valve for the first time if you got it all hooked up you tend to hear one or two pops when you do that and it, if you're not paying attention you may think the uh, excess flow in the car has popped you know the what it is is initially there's some slack there's always some tolerance in that ball and socket and however it is they got it attached so that when you first open it up you are taking out all of that slack initially before you lift that seat so you have that where you're taking out the tolerance and then as you lift that seating disc up you now have the force of the product coming up from the bottom pop pop doesn't necessarily mean anything's wrong just i tend to hear that far more often on a midland valve than i do a rego could just be machining tolerances or something it's never necessarily been an issue it's not necessarily been for me an indicator that there's something else wrong um, it one of the things that can go wrong oh here's another one that's actually um oh no not yet don't want to talk about that one yet that can also happen is you've got that seating disc and you got that ball and socket it doesn't happen very often but it does happen to where that valve stem can come right out of that seating disc for whatever reason they can pop out and it can be in a very somewhat mild way or it can be in, in a very uh, unnice way if it's a very mild way essentially what will happen is is when you open up a valve you have very little pressure on the top on the inside of the valve simply because you're just hooked up and then you got all the car pressure on the bottom so you go open it up and let's say it's broken you lift it up and the force will drive that seating disc right up like normal and if it happens to be on your vapor and you start shoving vapor pressure into the car that you'll just drive that seating disc right back down and your it'll your compressor will just start building pressure really quickly like something's been slammed shut you go shut down back off your compressor pressure sometimes the car pressure if there's enough in there will just push that seat right back up and it'll flow and you're thinking i don't really know what's wrong that can happen and if you're really really lucky that thing will just keep dropping and line right back up well enough to where you can thread the hand wheel down but another really common thing that'll happen is that when that seat drops 
that seating disc, when that disc drops, it'll drop at an angle. And when it drops at any kind of an angle, or off-center in any way, even if it's flat, you're not going to be able to lower that valve stem down, and you'll notice it when you go try to, to tighten it down. Um, you may only get that thing closed halfway, two-thirds of the way, something like that. And if that seating disc does come off, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't repair it. You can't... There's nothing. Your only thing you can do is put that car, when you get the liquid off, put that car in recovery and pull it down to zero PSI. It may, depends on the temperature, depends on everything, that could be an extra one, two hours of recovery time depending on your setup. But you need to get it down. Now granted, you probably could if you got that car down to one, two, or three PSI, you probably could uh, thread that plug right back in. But it's really not worth the risk. Your best thing is pull it down to zero PSI then you can remove your stinger and put the plug back in, tag that valve, and then go through the whole process of getting that thing OTMA to a shop. So it's probably something you, you may never run into. Uh, I've run into it and I, and I worked at another propane company in, in the bulk plant valve. I've known two other guys run into that uh, in rail cars, so it can't happen. These things, all these valves are really generally pretty well built. It's just that they get a lot of abuse. And sometimes they just break. And then I want to get to um, page 18. And I've got it highlighted down in here on the threaded flange. Midland's got a threaded flange. It's a four bolt flange. And they're showing here in this that if you're rebuilding this valve you need to decide if those threads are whether they're good or whether they're too worn out. They have, they mentioned in there, there's a uh, essentially go no go gauge you can thread in there. Or you can just hand thread in a pipe fitting. And they're saying that you should be able to hand thread in a fitting almost half of an inch. And if you can do that, then they're saying that's how you know it's a good flange. That is a good, that's a good rule of thumb. Simply because we're talking two inch, a fully engaged, properly fully engaged two inch pipe fitting should go in about three quarters of an inch. Maybe a little more, but about three quarters of an inch. And this is also where we need to be careful about torque values or declaring a torque value. Uh, the FRA has mentioned about that, about wanting guys to specify how, um, what do you torque your, those plugs in when you're done? Well, it's thread engagement is what matters and you can go on the internet you can find things that, that go and explain thread engagement essentially what it amounts to is you need to learn a different size pipe has different number of threads and there's a certain number of threads that need to be engaged in order for a fitting to be a good quality fitting you know good a good seal here we are we're talking two inch if you can, you're, I, I don't know, I'd have to go count. It's somewhere between 11 and 13 threads, I think, are in a standard 2-inch thread. So if you take a pipe plug and you thread it in and you tighten it down and you look and you have seven full threads showing, I don't care how tight that plug is, that plug is not properly seated. Either the thread pitch somewhere has been damaged or there's debris in there that is not a properly seated valve and consequently if you know we thread one in and all we have left showing is one thread well that's also the same thing it's not proper thread engagement 
And again, we run into the same problem over and over. It only takes one or two guys on a regular basis to overdo it, to ruin it for everybody else. But that's something I would encourage you to mention or, you know, in your SOPs or supplemental part to your SOPs or something, talking about how you tighten those things in, you know, and uh, I will, I've, I've told anybody that will listen that I will not play the torque game, the torquing in game. I, I just won't play that game. It's a losing game. Because all of us that are experienced know that tightening torque and loosening torque are not always the same number. There are so many other variables that apply. And if we have everything properly engaged, our threads are properly engaged, I should be able, with a 24-inch crescent wrench, adjustable wrench, putting in a 2-inch plug, I should be able to comfortably do that with one hand. I shouldn't have to take both hands and lean my body weight into it to get it properly engaged and properly seated. And another, off, well, it's the same topic, but it's, I've often wondered why is it that the FRA doesn't allow people like me, people like you, to replace these flanges and the plugs? There's nothing to it. Four bolts and an O-ring and you got that flange out. Four bolts and an O-ring and you got that flange back in. If it's a Rego, it's, I think it's eight. Eight bolts and an O-ring and you, you can replace it. So, I decided to start asking some questions and see if there was a reason why we weren't allowed to. Well, I got my answer back. And the short version of the answer is, is that the AAR, the American Association of Railroads, and is they're kind of the ones that set and oversee industry standards. And they act as an advisory panel, board, committee, whatever. They advise the FRA on what industry standard practices should be. Um, and it's a, it, it kind of makes sense simply because you can't expect the FRA to know everything or anything really about rail stuff because rail existed before the FRA and all this stuff existed and they're just kind of always playing catch up. Same thing when I used to be in cryogenics. The st who set the standard, you know? Well, some of these older, older cryogenics companies that were around at the beginning of the 20th century early part of the 20th century, that they were the ones that their extent, like Lindy, um, like uh, Air Gas, and some of the others, whatever their set, established principles, practices, best practices were, is what federal, state and federal, over government oversight agencies adopted and said, okay, this is the industry standard. Well, AAR has decided, their people have decided that doing anything on a valve is verboten. So no, no, they don't want anybody doing it. They'll let you do some other little things, but they won't let you do that. So if you got a problem, they want it to go to a shop. And so the FRA takes their lead and they say, yeah, you gotta send it to a shop. Even though you and I both know that the more we shop things that you know, we can fix, that just raises the price of product to our customer. But anyway, that's why they do it. And so early in 2020, I believe it was, is what I was told, there were some medium-sized shops, bigger than me of course, that used to do a lot of home repair there were a lot of things that they could do and they would do and they were authorized to do it. Well, as AAR has been advising and, and the government's been following and there's some, always some other things going on in the background that not everybody knows. The vast majority, if not all, of these medium-sized shops have given up all of their home repairs. They don't do anything either. It all goes to a big shop that's certified, trained, got all the fills out all the paperwork and all that other stuff. So I just wanted to share these things with you. I hope it helps. I encourage you to go. Um, 
One of the links there on Midland is the vapor float gauge uh, that we use every time we take car readings. It's a really good diagram. It'll give you a good understanding of how that works. And I just would encourage you to go read that and go read the Rego one. And uh, get a little bit more informed. You know, it, the more we know, the easier it is to troubleshoot, better it is to understand. And so, thank you.